So this is a continuation to the discussion about tools and technology, and I, I have this obsession that I have to do things in order. <laughs> and, and so we have to talk about writing, and we have to talk about uh, the beginnings of these things before I can move on. It's really a prelude to talking about machinery and machines and mechanization, which is, you know, for, from a certain perspective, that is the meaning of technology. So um, let's get right into it. So I have a whole video which explains what tools are, but to quickly recap, uh, human beings make at least two kinds of material objects, which we can call tools and the products of tools. Um, the definition of a tool is a long-lasting physical object which is intended to extend a human capability. So by long-lasting, we just mean it's not totally ephemeral. In other words, tools take a certain investment in time and effort to construct a non-trivial tool. And you can have a one-use tool, you know, like a plastic spoon or a plastic fork. But you could argue that a plastic spoon is a very decadent idea. And further, that you could say the actual tooling to make the plastic spoons. Further, you could say the actual tooling is in the machine which makes the plastic spoons. So the plastic spoon and fork is perhaps more of a product than a tool, right? So the other part of the definition is extending a human capability. So a pair of binoculars extends human vision. A hammer extends our ability to use the arm and hand to direct energy into the head of a nail, and so on. You know, the other main division that I, I mentioned is products, which is an object that we want for its own sake. So for example, a birthday cake, which we make with some tools like an oven and a beater and a spatula, it's something we want for its own sake. It does not do anything further or make anything further. It just gets cut up and eaten. You know, the act of putting candles on it and setting it on fire in ceremonial fashion is just part of the essence of a birthday cake. So this idea of things which extend human capabilities in order to make other things of intrinsic value is called making or production, building, creating. You know, we, we have all these words that represent that act. We use tools to do it, and, you know, in the human realm, and the result of tool using process is something we want or need, or perhaps some result we would like to achieve. And that result is always caused through uh, what I am saying is an extension of our physical body. You know, this is the key idea of tools. Everything that we do with a tool, no matter how inconsequential, is really just an extension of the capabilities of our own body and mind, of ourselves. So one proof of this fact is that the things we do with tools, if we do them well, result in a subtle quality called style. So if I cook for you, the result, you know, the food I make for you, will be very identifiable as something I made because I have a particular cooking style I'm a vegetarian and a vegan, and I, you know, I do things a certain way. It's not just the ingredients, but um, the kitchen tools, the processes, the order in which I do things, the timing, you know, and so on. So style is related to tools, and the evidence of style is actually evidence of human expression, because when I'm cooking, I, you know, if you eat the food I make, it is in some sense something that I made for you. It's an expression for you to be, you know, it's, it's almost a story, right? It's almost a story. And if it's at the height of cooking, you get to the point where people say that it is a story. So sometimes we think style might be more tightly coupled with art. You know, we think of style and art. But anything which is sufficiently complex, taken as a process that people do, anything which has sufficiently broad field and is done by human beings using tools can have style. Now, if we begin to go down this road, what we will find is that style becomes integrated into attenuated crowds. But we're not going to go there today. We're not going to talk about crowds today. Getting back to tools, um, 
We want to call out that because they cause the human body to have additional capabilities or extended capabilities, we can say that they are human. They are really, tools are part of the human experience. There are no tools that people make, you know, by definition, that are not in the realm of the human body. Tools support entirely human and specifically human capabilities, and sometimes they are much more specific. For example, I'm left-handed, so I need left-handed uh, scissors. My guitar is made for a left-handed person. And so tools can get much more specific than just broadly for humans. Tools can actually be specific to the point of being for a specific human being, tuned specifically to that one human being. However, um, we'll soon see that there are objects human beings make which go beyond tools in the sense that they do more than extend the capabilities of the human body. And so that's actually where we're going with this. I know this is, sounds very pedantic, but where we're going with this is that we want to be very careful about how we describe mechanization. We know where we're going with this is mechanization, but we can't jump ahead too, too fast. We have to understand uh, what came before mechanization, really, to understand it. So the other thing to observe in the above is that there's a relationship between tools and products that all tools are originally products. You know, you have to make a tool. Unless the tool is just accidental, like a stick you find to use as a walking stick that you just pick up, a tool has to be made. And they're sometimes themselves a result of a pretty significant construction process. And this relationship of bootstrapping, possibly of recursion, where one tool has to be made first, so a different tool can then be made second, will become very important in the discussion about mechanization. So we are at that moment now in which we will introduce the idea of a derivative. And we can do this by thinking about writing, by looking at, at the invention of writing. So it's possible that everyone watching this video uh, can read and write. There was a time in human history not very long ago in the biological scheme of things when no one at all could read and write. So this is a thing you have to do when you're working with transformations, when you're studying transformations, is that you have to imagine that there was a time before human beings could do something. And what was that time like? What was the human experience like? Something that I think is one of my contributions, I, I can say, you know, humbly speaking, <laughs> I can say this is a contribution that I'm making, that I am, I am calling out that if you want to understand history, you have to think about it, that any human experience, there was a time before people could do that thing. If any technology that you can name, electricity or, you know, using a broom or uh, anything you like, a, a spoon and a fork, all of those things, there was a time before anyone had ever used that. There was a time before anyone had an idea of such a thing being possible. And so to understand history and civilization, you have to understand how we get from where we were with our ontogeny to where we are that we have these things. That is the secret. That is the thing that, that we have to uh, think about when we're working with transformations. So going back, you know, it's probable that everyone watching this video can read and write. Before reading and writing, uh, let's say perhaps 10,000 BC, trade existed and the beginnings of farming and animal husbandry were going on and the very first cities were, were starting to be constructed. So suppose that I'm a trader and I want to uh, uh, get some goods somewhere. Or easier, let's just say, suppose I'm a sheep, uh, you know, I have sheep to sell. And I have a buyer for those sheep. But we have a problem, which is that, you know, let's say you're the buyer, you live pretty far away. So I send my trusted man with some sheep. And we do not have to have a number of sheep in mind. Perhaps we just say that you want to buy all the spring lambs that were born that, that season. And we agree upon a price. And my trusted man sets out with the lambs. So now all goes well, except that you, the buyer, were expecting, you know, more lambs than you got. Because when you visited, you saw more, tangibly more, 
then we're delivered. And notice at this point we don't have anything specific written down. That doesn't exist yet. But you saw some quantity when you saw my herd. And you know, you believed that there would be more. So now you're unhappy. This is a serious problem. Either I've cheated you, or maybe my trusted man, you know, is not so trustworthy. Maybe he cooked some of the lambs on the way. <laughs> you know, and we no one can say for sure. So what to do? Well, the Sumerian answer. And by the way, this is all true. You know, I'm not inventing this or making this up. This is, this is archaeologically demonstrated. The Sumerian answer was for me to make a little clay pot. A little, take some clay. You know, fortunately for the Sumerians, they had lots of clay. So they took some clay and they molded a little pot with it. And inside that pot, I'm going to put one little ball of clay for each lamb that is being sent to you. Now notice it's not necessary at any point for me to count the lambs. I merely need to make a little clay ball for each one and create this one-to-one -one correspondence, which is really probably the most basic form of mathematical equality, probably the most basic form of mathematics is this one-to-one -one correspondence. And then I'm going to put these little balls into this little clay cup that I made. And then I'm going to seal up that cup and then I'm going to, I have a little circular seal, a, a, little, a little carved piece of stone. And it has my mark on it. And I'm going to press that into the clay. And you, my buyer, know that symbol. And perhaps it's an animal totem of my house, or it represents a god, or, you know, of the gods of my house, or something like that. I, I can't remember precisely what the Sumerians do. Uh, you'll forgive me for not being precise. But that symbol represents me personally, and it's, it's my seal, or at least the seal of my house. And, and that process works very well with clay. So now what do I have? Well, I have this little container made out of clay, which has the same number of balls in it as the number of lambs I'm sending you. And it has my mark on it, so you know it's from me. And I send that with my trusted servant when he takes you the lambs. And this works beautifully. You know, this is actually how it was done. And that process was done for hundreds of years and possibly for thousands of years. That, that, that worked. So people did not need to know how to write and people did not need to know how to read in order to create a signal and send a signal. Now, perhaps you can see that where this is going because Instead of making a little pot, if I just roll out a slab of clay and just make some ticks on it, one for each of the lambs, and then I put my seal on that, and, and if I let that dry, that's going to become indelible. You know, you can't erase that. And and since my trusted man doesn't have that stamp and since that stamp probably has some you know it's vested with some religious authority or whatever you know he's not going to falsify that so um uh and, and also you know people may not know but i i've worked with clay so i can tell you that you, you you're not once that piece of clay dries you don't even have to bake it it's not going to be, you're not going to be able to alter that clay without detection that it has been changed. Because it is one of the properties of clay that it, it has a remarkable uh, ability to retain, you know, like you, actually when you're touching clay, you can actually see your own fingerprints in the clay. And that's retained there. So... This was the invention of writing, or at least it, it is one way that writing was invented. It is almost certainly the way that writing was invented in Mesopotamia. You know, it's how we got cuneiform eventually. And it involved business, it involved trade, it was mathematical. It had to do with describing things that are quantitative and also with identification. That is, determining that I am the center of the signal you know, who made the signal and thus is the signal authoritative? Is it to be believed? So right at the very beginning of writing, there are these things, quantities and also identification. Where is the signal from? Now, from here to cuneiform, you know, there are several steps, but it's not really very far. 
we have to go from pictographs or those tick marks to symbols in a phonetic alphabet. And it it's a job for a linguist to explain. Um, now, interestingly, I was looking at Wikipedia, you know, at the beginnings of writing in the Wikipedia. And so they start the, art, the Wikipedia article, which I will put in the comments, starts at the point of the pictic, of, of the uh, phonetic, you know, the basics of phonetic writing or hier hieroglyphic writing. They don't talk about this earlier part. But if you go and read about archaeology of Sumeria, you will find this. This is a known thing. I'm not making this up. <laughs> this, this is true. Everything that I'm telling you is, is a true story in, in, in the sense that it's a generality, but it actually happened in a, in a way that is similar to that. I'm not going to talk now about how the, the way that that process uh, is very much like evolution that it is cultural evolution but that is we'll save that for for another day but going back to 10,000 BC or perhaps now we're up to 5,000 BC we now have a system of writing because we've gone from those tick marks to now we want to actually try to get our speech down on that we've figured that out and not very many people know how to read and write at this stage 5,000 BC but there are some now who do. There are some now who have that transformation inside themselves as related to that story signal. So the obvious question to ask in our current context is, you know, okay, what is writing? Is it a product of tool making to be consumed like a birthday cake? Is it a one use thing? Or does it fit the definition of a long lasting physical object which is intended to extend a human capability? And the answer is both, because writing can be used in many different ways. You know, it's, the most interesting part is the relationship between speech, which is this ephemeral thing, you know, I'm doing it right now, and the clay or stone tablet, which is this long-lasting physical object that can, in some sense, speak the thing that I want to say indefinitely or even interminably. <laughs> One time I went to uh, an airport in California, I think it was the John Wayne uh, Airport, it was called, uh, and um, they were continually announcing, and actually any airport that you go to, there's these continual announcements being made over and over and over and over, and they're very loud and obnoxious. So I thought about this idea of, of speech being, you know, interminable, that at least when someone is speaking like me, <laughs> when I'm speaking, at least I shut up eventually. <laughs> Writing makes it possible that uh, someone can speak interminably, endlessly. As long as the receiver is able to go through the transformation required to resurrect the contents of that message, it can continue to speak. You know, the tablet can be read. So there are tablets from Mesopotamia which specialists today can read and understand it's thousands of years later. So this extended capability of separating and detaching speech from the human body and making it distinctly speak outside, away from the body where it originated, that is one of the most important extensions that human beings have ever managed to achieve. And it is probably the cornerstone of, to civilization. So the usual way of understanding these things is to think about writing as a form of abstraction, which is not wrong, but it misses the connection to the human body, and it misses the uh, sort of, you could say, the, the evolutionary aspect, you know, which is part of the origin of the aspect of, uh, as part of the origin of the act of writing. So people write because they want to extend the reach of what they are saying, not because they want to create an abstraction for its own sake, just to be abstract. People write because they want to extend the reach of what they are saying naturally through their body. And they want that to be extended. And if you think about that one idea, it will take you a long ways. So the next observation about writing we can make is that once a tablet's been written, then someone who can perform the transformation required to read it can make another tablet which is the same signal. And I have a word for this. I say that the second tablet is derived from the first. So you can say, if you like, that the second tablet is a copy. But 
That ignores the process which was required to go from the first to the second. The scribe has to read and understand the first tablet in order to make the second. You know, you really can't reasonably imagine that someone can make a copy of a complex cuneiform tablet without knowing cuneiform, right? So there's already a sense in English that things which are derivative are the result of a lack of originality, a lack of creativity. You know, a derivative song is in some sense just copying the elements from some more popular song. In the way songwriters for the monkeys, say, derived their material, at least stylistically, from, you know, the Beatles. But when I talk about derivatives, I'm not going to mean something pejorative. When a human being consumes a story signal, which then becomes part of their ontogeny, which has changed them, then it's perfectly natural for that person to repeat the story, and in fact it is expected. And that repetition becomes a derivation, is derived from the original story. And this actually needs to be part of the full description of story signals, uh, is that the repetition is a derivation, it's derived. So there's an influential short piece by Walter Benjamin, or Benjamin, you know, <laughs> if you prefer, and it's called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. And unfortunately, Benjamin gets almost everything wrong due to his use of Marxism as the primary lens to look at things. But the point to make here is that thinking about mechanical reproduction is jumping ahead too far, which is what he did. You know, first you have to have a theory of tools and style and commerce, um, which we now have in hand. And I guess for Benjamin, he thought that Marxism gave him that. But we're going to be able to carefully think about what the definition of a machine is using what we now know. Because first of all, prior to thinking about mechanical reproduction, you have to understand me mechanics. What is the mechanical? And you have to understand what is meant by reproduction, reproducing something. And so, we now have, uh, after this video, I will be able to talk about those things. So if you like this kind of story signal and you want more and to find out about uh, the definition of the mechanical things, then please subscribe to my channel. It will show me that someone's interested in what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thanks so much.